Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to Ethos Limited Q1 FI24 Earnings Conference Call. This conference call may contain forward-looking statements about the company which are based on the beliefs, opinions and expectations of the company as on date of this call. These statements are not the guarantees of future performance and involve risk and uncertainties that are difficult to predict. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen-only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during this conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Pranav Sabu, CEO from Ethos Limited. Thank you and over to you, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us on Ethos Limited Quarter 1 FY24 Earnings Conference Call. I hope everyone had a chance to view our financial results and investor presentation which were recently posted on the company's website and stock exchanges. I am accompanied by our Chairman and Managing Director, Mr. Yasho Vardhan Sabu, and our CFO, Mr. Ritesh Agarwal, and SGA, our Investor Relations Advisors, on this call today. FY24 has started on a positive note, and we are confident that this is a sustainable trend. We believe that the luxury watch demand will continue to remain robust and grow steadily. Our strategy and plan to gain market share without compromising profitability will continue together with steady expansion of our product and brand portfolio. It is extremely heartening to see that the watch brands support this view of ethos and have continued to extend full support to grow the Indian market with us. This is evident from the increase in marketing spending by brands, exclusive launches of timepieces for the Indian market, simultaneous launches of watches in India and the globe, with the globe, and of course, better product allocation for India. Ethos is best placed to capitalize on this trend with its strong presence and understanding of the Indian luxury watch market. It is essential for us to continue our pursuit of elevating the luxury experience for our clients. We are in the progress of making significant investments in our showrooms during the year as well as renovating existing boutiques. These investments backed by our proven business model impactful marketing and dedication to client service will help us grow the market and gain market share. Let me give you an overview of our quarter one performance. Revenue from operations is up by 33% to rupees 230 crores from rupees 170 crores in quarter one FY23. EBITDA for the quarter grew by 32% year on year to rupees 38.6 crores in Q1 FY24. You will surely note that our margin has been impacted. This is solely due to a significant increase in the exchange rate between INR and CHF, which has changed from 82 to 83 in the first quarter of last year and rupees 85, 86 in December 22 to above or approximately 95 rupees now. That is a change of nearly 13% from December. About 75% of brands have now taken the price increase in accordance with the INR CHF rate at 91, which was the average rate for the first quarter of the calendar. The balance 25% are still at 85-86 range of December 22. This unprecedented gap means that even as cost has increased, the selling price still needs to be revised by the brands. We expect that prices across brands will be corrected by January or earlier, and margin will be fully restored, and the effect of our ex margin expansion strategy will start to show up next year in great display. The forex hit was around 110 basis points in this quarter, over and above the 77 lakhs, which is payment related. Profit after tax 
for quarter one, FY24 was rupees 18.2 crores as compared to rupees 12.8 crores in Q1 FY23, which grew 42% on a year-on-year basis. Inventory days as on 30th June stood at 147 days. Gross debt stood at rupees 8.2 crores as on 30th June 2023. Cash and cash equivalents stood at 212 crores as on 30th June 2023. Before we go for the question and answer part of our discussion, allow me to discuss a few more points. At Ethos, mastery of luxury watches is synonymous with a commitment to product innovation and knowledge. This is enabled and leveraged with impact and effectiveness through the participation of our teams at renowned watch fairs in Switzerland. Our team is invited to these fairs by watch brands to learn more about their products and to give feedback. This enables us to a superior product portfolio to Indian consumers with refined service. We believe Ethos will lead the way of getting more brands and better products to India in the future. While expanding our operations rapidly, we continue to keep a close watch on costs. We maintain stringent cost controls to ensure an efficient operation, particularly rental costs. On a regular basis, we are assessing the performance of all retail stores and we take location-related decisions based on the performance of each store. We continue to pursue our growth strategy through a combination of targeted capital investment in showrooms and driving operational leverage. Let me now talk about the pre-owned market. This is a positive development for the retail market. This is a growing sector. While there has been some cooling down of the excessive heat in the international market, it remains an area of huge potential everywhere and especially in India. We are putting greater resources and marketing efforts to ensure full justice to the unique opportunity we have built in the pre-owned market. During quarter one, growth was impacted because our second movement boutique was non-functional for two months due to ongoing renovation and litigation of the mall that we are in. We expect it to be back on stream quite soon. Let me talk now about new boutiques. Around the end of last fiscal year, we had indicated that we have planned about 40 new openings in the next two fiscal years, of which 20 to 25 will be in the current fiscal. I am pleased to inform you that in the last quarter, we have opened six new boutiques and added three new cities, Surat, Bhubaneswar, and Raipur on the ethos map. I am pleased to inform you that we have several new openings coming up in the next quarter. Our first Remova boutique will be coming up in the Geo World Plaza Mall in BKC, Mumbai. As many as six boutiques will come up at Mall of Asia, the new super luxury mall in Bangalore. This includes five mono brand boutiques and one Ethos Summit multi-brand store. Furthermore, two stores, one multi-brand and one brand boutique will open at the Mall of Millennium in Pune. We will strengthen our position at Select City Walk in New Delhi with a new mono-brand boutique uh, opening very soon. In addition, new openings are in the pipeline for expanding our presence in Mumbai, Delhi NCR, Kochi, and other new cities. We have also signed more brands for our portfolio. These are the Swiss brands. Perole, Ikepod, Eterna, and Alpina. The highly focused German brand Mühlegast Glashutte and a unique hard-to-get brand from Belgium, Rezons, much loved and sought after by connoisseurs. These brands have some outstanding innovations in their product portfolio and significantly add to making the Ethos product and brand portfolio more comprehensive. I should mention Ethos will be the only retailer for these brands in India. We sign these brands with a long-term view. These are all exclusive brands and we believe will give positive impacts in the long term. We now have a strong portfolio of exclusive brands and we have many more brands that want to work with us exclusively in the future, which we will consider to work with. 
There is more good news, ladies and gentlemen. I am pleased to share with you what I consider among so many positive advances, the most exciting development, the most exciting of all developments at Ethos. As many of you are aware, we recently acquired controlling majority of Silver City Brands AG in Switzerland, which acquired all the intellectual property assets of the iconic Swiss brand, Favorlova. Favorlova is the second oldest Swiss watch brand in history. I want to repeat that to underline the significance, it is the second oldest Swiss watch brand, established in 1737 with over 286 years of heritage. This was before electricity was discovered, before the British ruled India. Its history is storied. Its heritage in the world of horology is legendary. Our vision for Favorlova is to preserve and celebrate its remarkable past while infusing it with contemporary allure that resonates with current and future watch collectors. The management team in Silver City is now being selected, and together with them, we aim to re-establish Powerloba as, leading, as a leading global Swiss watch brand, as it was in the decades past. Rest assured that we are committed to nurturing this long-term investment, and our effort will be directed towards creating timepieces that evoke the essence of Powerloba, while sparking desire in watch aficionados worldwide. Together with our strategic partners, we are investing in a brand with a timeless heritage, and we are excited to see it flourish in the Ethos Watch Boutique Network and retailers around the world. The focus will be on crafting exceptional timepieces that not only honor the brand's history, but also embody the aspiration of present and future watch collectors. In, in conclusion, let me re quickly recap for you the gist of our efforts over the last decade to create a unique luxury retail story in India. Long-standing collaborative partnerships with the most prestigious and recognized luxury watch brands now being extended to other categories. Stunning boutiques with exceptional service to provide an unparalleled client experience. Cutting edge marketing, with a strong digital focus and a strong focus on storytelling. Finally, let me express my deep gratitude to each of you, our valued shareholders and analysts who have believed our story. I'd like to express my heartfelt gratitude to our brand partners, dedicated teams, location collaborators, and all stakeholders, internal and external, who have played an integral role in this successful quarter. However, the true credit for this monumental success goes to the robust Indian economy and the unwavering spirit of Indians who aspire to make a mark on the global stage. As our nation strides forward, we at Ethos take immense pride in being a part of this journey, echoing the dreams and aspirations of every Indian. Thank you for trusting us and joining us on this exciting voyage. With this, I would like to open a session for question and answers and invite our chairman to take over. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. Participants, you may press star and one to ask a question. The first question is from the line of Devanshu Bansal from MP Global Financial Service. Please go ahead. Hi, Dr. Anshu. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, thanks for the opportunity and uh, many congratulations on uh, a very strong matter uh, across all revenue in the dark uh, Sir, uh, 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 Pranav alluded to this, but uh, there has been a significant fall in prices of uh, second-hand luxury watches uh, globally. Uh, so, wanted to understand better what is leading to uh, such a fall in prices. 
and uh, does uh, this in any way have any read through for our both new watch as well as uh, pre owned business? Next number uh, one. Is this your only question or are there other uh, questions as Why don't you ask all of them so we can answer together? Sure, sir. Uh, second, uh, we have uh, indicated about uh, controlling stake in, stake in uh, several Yuba. Uh, so the other larger uh, company, Titan, sort of struggled in ramping up this brand. Uh, so what are the key learnings uh, that we would like to implement and uh, what is the kind of investments uh, that we are planning to make uh, uh, to ramp up uh, this brand? Uh, the third one is uh, our ASP has encouragingly uh, been increasing. Uh, so this time around it is 12% uh, uh, this quarter versus last year. Uh, and this is despite, I guess, uh, we were of the opinion that some uh, low-end watches will also sort of uh, uh, start coming uh, into the picture now. Uh, so what is sort of uh, uh, driving this and uh, what are our expectations uh, 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 for the coming quarters? Uh, I have more, sir. Maybe I will uh, uh, join back in the queue. Uh, for sure. Time. Okay. So, uh, your first question was on the prices of pre-owned watches. Uh, it's true, the prices of pre-owned watches worldwide have come down a lot. But it's very, very important to understand this in perspective. You know, in the initial times of, of COVID, the prices had gone up like 200 and 300 percent. Uh, there were many uh, brands and in those brands several watches for which the retail price, suggested retail price was 100 and the price in the pre-owned market jumped up to 300 and 400. Now that is a, uh, I mean that is an overheated market as everybody knew at that time and that was not sustainable. So obviously that bubble had to subside, it has subsided. But what is sobering is to remember that what was 100, it went up to 300 and now it has come down from 300 to maybe 250 or 220, and people are seeing that it has declined from 300 to 200, but not realizing that the original price of the watch was 200. So I think it's a uh, it's it's froth which is going away. Uh, the substance is still very solid, and the basic arguments for the success of the pre-owned market are absolutely undented. The, the uh, you know, crazy purchase of watches in return for, you know, immediate gains of 100, 200, 300 percent is obviously not sustainable. And I think it's healthy for the market that the prices reflect a reality. And today, uh, good brands in the pre-owned market still have the good prices and the demand, uh, though corrected, is still going to grow pretty strongly. And especially so in India. So we are not at all worried on that account. Except, of course, that when there is a correction, then people uh, don't know where it's going to stabilize and so on. So that, there's a little bit of uh, uh, this, let's say, disturbance in the market. But, I mean, all of you guys dealing in the stock markets are aware of these turbulences. And they try, take time to settle down, and the underlying trend actually is always uh, uh, there. The second question was regarding the controlling stake and about Faber-Luba and, and Titan. Well, you know... I mean, Titan is one of the most fabulous com uh, companies in India, and their mastery in the watch business is, is unparalleled. I don't want to comment on, you know, what are the reasons why, uh, you know, they, they didn't continue with, with Father Luba or whatever. I can only say that we believe Father Luba to be an excellent uh, 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 brand with a huge potential. Um, we, we, we don't know why... Uh, what happened with Titan and, and why it happened, but we have a pretty clear idea of how we're going to develop it. Pranav already alluded to that. We are waiting for, not waiting, but we are working on establishing the team. We have to, we have, you have to know that it is a Swiss brand. It will always be managed. There will be Swiss watches produced in Switzerland. All the operations will be there. The marketing strategy, everything will be driven from Switzerland. And it's our job to find the right uh, management team. We are in the process of doing that, and together with the team, we'll create uh, the business plan, the product strategies, um, and of course, then we will come to know what are the kind of uh, precise investments that are involved. Uh, we believe that with reasonable investments and a sound strategy and a good leadership in Switzerland, uh, this will be a huge success, and the success will come pretty soon. 
The last question was regarding ASP. Yes, ASP is going up. It will continue to go up, but ASP is not our only focus. We, we believe that uh, AS, together with ASP, with our spread of uh, boutiques into smaller cities, uh, there will also be a growth of some of the entry-level brands and the interplay of both higher number of more expensive brands as well as some addition in the mid-price and low-price categories, uh, this will lead to a steady increase, though it may not be that fast as you saw in the first three years of, or in the first two years of COVID. But we expect ASP to continuously go up steadily. Got it, sir. So I have one uh, follow-up question on Pavel Nipa. So you indicated uh, that operationally, uh, what kind of investments uh, that will be there, you will get to know um, uh, in a few quarter time. Just wanted to check if there will be any capital investment in terms of uh, manufacturing capacity or something like that, uh, which we will be making here. Yeah. It's a little early, it's a little premature, uh, uh, Devanshu, to say that, because there are several models, right? You can, of, of operating and uh, creating Swiss watches, you can do it yourself. There are specialists, depend on what kind of products, what movements, what are the embellishments we do, uh, what are the kind of handwork or specializations that are added. And these are details of product strategies which are extremely important. And, you know, these are things which we can decide only once we have the brand, we have the full chance. And our team in Switzerland will have the full chance of studying the history, the full heritage, what is the marketing materials. You know, there, is a, there are a huge number of patents. At the watch museum in La Chaux de Fonds in Switzerland, there are some examples of old Father Luba watches and the patents that they had, which are absolutely remarkable. And, you know, these are not, these are not fully known. Uh, and, uh, you know, for example, uh, Father Luba made Bivouac, which was the first watch mechanically to measure altimeter. It was Faber Nuba, which was worn by the wrist on uh, on the wrist by uh, Junko Tabe, the first woman who conquered Everest, who climbed Everest. So there are there is a huge heritage. We are still discovering it. Our team in Switzerland, once they're in place, they have to discover it. They have to interpret it. How they're going to use it to create the new product portfolio. It's going to be it's going to be very interesting, but very hard work. But when it finally comes out, I can guarantee you, it will shine brightly, and you would love it. Got it, sir. Then this is really encouraging. Uh, I have more questions. I'll join back in the future. May I just uh, add in a few points on all these questions because I feel that these questions will be repeated in in future questions. Um, I do want to say that um, there there is a lot of talk about uh, correction of secondhand watches. I do want to underline the fact that it is limited to less than seven eight percent of the brands that we operate with where these corrections are happening and that too in about 20 to 25 percent of their collection of these 78 percent of the brand. So there is a lot of pieces which were known as high pieces which have corrected a little bit but a large percentage of the, the majority of our business continues to be unimpacted that is the second hand or the pre-owned watch business continues to be unimpacted in pricing in these uh, watches. So yes, there is a lot of media coverage that they, that wants to cover a few pieces that went up 300% and has corrected 20%, but the majority of the business was not these time pieces and it remains unaffected by that. And secondly, on Favadova, I do want to, in, to say that we will always make a plan that is um, exciting for all our stakeholders, consumers, as well as the people who are investing behind the brand, and there will be um, financial prudence in all our decision making. I believe that we have unique skills, right? We have skills that um, are uh, different from uh, previous owners of Favalova. Um, we have great respect for them. I do believe that our luxury niche and focused uh, our focus on, on luxury gives us unique skills, and perhaps it fits better in a business of our, a smaller size uh, like ours than it did for previous owners, which we have deep, deep respect for and are giants today in uh, our consumer business world. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you, Bernard.
Next question is from the line of Rahul Agarwal from Incred Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, good afternoon, Hello. evening, and hi. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. So, three questions. Firstly, on uh, both of the businesses, New Watch and CPO. Any material change in our thoughts uh, versus what we had planned a year back? Uh, you know, case in you know, example could be like something like Silver Lubo, which happened. Uh, anything else you'd like to highlight, like your thoughts on what and jewelry together going forward? Uh, inventory management is pretty much the same across new watch building and CPO, or is it any different? Uh, or, or any other new thought which you have, which you think can you know uh, make things better than what we thought of? That's my first question. Uh, second was on margins. Uh, so obviously, Pranav alluded that margins should get better once pricing correction happens. Uh, my sense was uh, obviously there will be some uh, basic impact of new store openings as well because the OPEX will go up in sync. Uh, my sense was uh, you know, post in days, pre in days, however you want to look at, margins should largely sustain in this band, which is what it is currently uh, for the rest of the year. So just any thoughts on that? And lastly, if I can get the numbers from Ritesh on new watch and CPO sales, both including and excluding GST, please. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, sir. Um, <clears throat> you know, in terms of new learning, both for new watches and CPO, I can't really think of anything. I mean, our strategy was pretty clear. We have we have implemented that strategy. The office team has done a fabulous job to do that. Uh, of course, as you go along, there are there are changes in the environment, and I think we've been flexible to adapt to them. When there are opportunities, we grab them where sometimes things have not panned out exactly as we had thought. I think we've covered up using, you know, whatever means we had. Um, and uh, and that's the reason why we can be happy that, you know, we are actually quarter after quarter we are able to share results that are actually ahead of whatever we had expected and also ahead of the guidance that we have been giving from time to time. So nothing really new to share at the moment, uh, except that, you know, as and when things happen, of course, uh, we will share uh, all the news with you as uh, as our partners. As far as uh, your uh, margins uh, question is concerned, I think on margins we, uh, uh, you know, of course, there is the impact of new stores and some OPEX leading the sales. So that impact is, of course, there. But you will see an impact also on the gross margin, and the gross margin is purely a result of the exchange rate. Um, to the to the uh, extent that there's an impact in a, at a bigger level, there it could be it could involve some opex uh, issues as well, opex costs as well. As far as the prices and uh, of new and CPO watches are concerned, I think uh, I let uh, uh, Ritesh do that, but. Can we get back to you on this later, Raul? There's a long list of other people who want to uh, ask questions. And, uh, you know, this is something which we can connect separately on. Sure, not a problem. Thank you so much for answering my questions. All the best. Thanks, Raul. Thank you. Thank you. Participants, you may press star and one to ask a question. Next question is from the line of Bhavya Sonavla from Samsa Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, sir. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, hope I am audible. Hello? Yes, you are audible. Yeah, so I just have uh, two questions. So the first question is with respect to FAF. So the line for the participant dropped. We move on to the next participant. Yes, please. Next question is from the line of Ankush Agarwal from Search Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, sir. Thank you for taking my questions and congrats on a great set of numbers. Uh, firstly, a couple of data points. Uh, what was the SSG for the quarter? Uh, share of exclusive brands in terms of revenues. And a clarity that uh, the six stores that we have opened, uh, this has been before June. Uh, so, number of stores that were open and number of stores, if any, that we have closed uh, during the quarter. Right. So let me answer the, uh, the last one so that is easiest. Yes, these six stores were open in the period April to June. And the count uh, which you see now is, is that. 
Uh, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, no store was opened in July. Thank you. No store has been opened in July, but there are more openings coming up. SSG for uh, this quarter has been just one minute has been 23 percent. It's a very very good figure, and the share of exclusive brands has been uh, 30 percent. 30 percent. Okay. Uh, and secondly, uh, again on this uh, strategy of acquiring a Swiss brand, uh, would you would, would it be possible for you to share, you know, the current state of uh, this brand? Uh, because I think the cost that you have paid to acquire the brand is quite minuscule. Uh, so, was it a defunct brand? If you have any history to share, like uh, at a point of time where it was doing good, it, it uh, went under. Like any history that you can share that would help us understand more, like how we can grow this brand. It's, you know that's a uh, that's that's a question that that requires a one and a half hour presentation because the history of that <laughs> over the last 280 years is so so fabulous. Uh, but if you fast forward it, I mean the the brand uh, was active until 2019, and after that, uh, during the COVID years, it went it went into let's say it was inactive. And uh, I mean, then in the last quarter we purchased the brand. Or SCB, uh, Silver City Brands uh, purchased it, and we have uh, controlling interest in the Swiss entity. So, would uh, uh, can we assume that uh, this is one of the many brands that Ethos might look to hold in its own portfolio in the very long run, or this is just uh, I think. One opportunity that you. That's not, uh, uh, by the way, sorry, that's not that's not really the idea to hold a lot of brands. I think we have to understand that, uh, you know, to 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 nurture a brand, it requires a lot of effort. It requires a lot of mind, of course, financial engagement as well. And our goal is not really to amass a whole bunch of brands, but uh, you know, if we acquire a brand or if we take controlling interest in a brand, or even if we invest in a brand, even without controlling interest, as we've done in uh, in one case, I think we want to contribute to that brand becoming a huge success uh, at a global scale. And therefore, I think it's quality uh, more than just number of brands. What will, what, will, what will give us great satisfaction is if the brand Faber Luba really achieves the fame that it had at a global level, several decades ago, and we believe that's completely possible. Does it mean that we will not acquire or acquire interest in or controlling interest in any brands in the future? We can't say, but uh, there is nothing as of now that is on the cards. Our focus is really uh, to make this brand a huge success. Okay, correct. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Next question is from the line of Bhavya Sonavla from Samsa Capital. Please go ahead. Welcome back, Bhavya. Yeah, sorry for before, sir. So basically, uh, I had two questions. The first question was with respect to Fabuluba. Uh, will we uh, keep these watches with, uh, probably showcase these watches with the other retailers in India and probably internationally over time? And my second question is, uh, when we come with exclusive brands and set up a store in association with them, like we did with Jacobin Company, uh, what is the kind of agreement or is there any difference in a normal store and you know, exclusive store with brands? So, you know, for Pavlova, what I can say is that the ambition of the brand is to regain its global presence. What will be the policies for India is something that the brand has to decide once, you know, they're ready to take that decision. And that will be a decision that's going to happen in Switzerland uh, when when the time comes. But uh, for sure, the ambitions are to make it a global brand. And of course, Ethos having controlling interest, we uh, we not only are interested in the brand, but of course, we have great plans for it uh, in India as well. As far as the exclusive brand boutiques are concerned, uh, well, you know, in the sense that uh, typically. Uh, Brands, when they establish a exclusive boutique, they make available exclusive uh, boutique additions to that. There is a lot more marketing concentrated around the, the exclusive brand boutique because in a way that's not only a place to make those products available, but it's also to showcase uh, of the uh, and the prestige of the brand. So it, it 
plays a dual role not only to uh, to, to sell watches but also to present and establish the preeminence of the brand and to that extent of course there are separate uh, terms typically there could be some separate terms for a mono brand boutique compared to participation in the multi brand stores oh, okay i understand Thank you, may, I give, may I use this opportunity to give one example of, of the Jacob boutique that has been given. We were able to design uh, a product uh, with Jacob because we work exclusively. We also have rights for exclusive editions for India. Uh, these exclusive editions for India have done extremely well. Uh, for the launch of the boutique, we celebrated it with the launch of an 11-piece uh, Jacob in steel, Epic X at 26 lakh rupees MRP, 11 pieces were sold in under 36 hours. On Wednesday, we are going to launch the gold edition of this, another 11 pieces, at 56 lakhs, which will also, we believe, be sold by the end of the month. Um, I think that these give us extremely good opportunities and long-standing relationships with these brands. Jacob himself will be coming down into India for a, for a, a large event, which will be a star-studded event in October. So it gives us much greater, they, they are able to give us much greater focus and it allows us to do business in an unprecedented manner uh, because the boutique gives us this leverage. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, so is it fair to assume that um, the pieces available in the exclusive stores majorly won't be available in any other multi-brand uh, stores that we uh, have, right? No, it's a it gives us the opportunity to do this. It will be available there, but okay. the priority goes to the boutique. Understood. Yeah, because we don't want to be limited by, let's say, it's 11 pieces this year. Next year, we'll do a larger edition. But it is the boutique that gives us the right to be able to design these pieces along with uh, Jacob. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. Participants, you may press star and one to answer the question. Next question is from the line of Abhishek Agarwal from Naredi Investments. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, sir. Thanks for giving me opportunity and congrats on good number. Am I audible, sir? Yes, you are, Abhishek. Oh, okay, okay. Sir, I have two questions. Uh, first, there is a supply side constraint on costly watches as few manufacturer and buyer are more. How you deal this situation? Second question. What is the uh, cost of showroom open in Raipur like uh, and uh, in how much time it comes It comes in break-even point? Uh, third question, what growth in top line and bottom line we, expect, we expected in next few years? And last question, average selling price going up every year after year and quarter after quarter. Where you see in next three-year time period? That's all my question. Thank you. Thank you, Abhishek. First question was regarding supply side uh, constraints. Now, that's the reality of uh, the luxury watch business. Um, you know, luxury watches are not automatically produced on uh, assembly lines where you can just speed it up. There is a huge amount of uh, designing content that goes, the manufacture of components, the assembly, the design of the watch, and putting together by skilled watchmakers in Switzerland. Now, these, you cannot just invent these. They are already working full out. And uh, the demand has gone up a lot. As you know, in India as well, as everywhere in the world, the demand for premium and luxury watches has gone up a lot. It's not really possible to maintain the same quality, the same exclusivity, and you know, churn out larger production. That's not the philosophy of the brands. So, unfortunately, supply side constraints is a reality that we will have to live with. And it's not only in the luxury watch business. If you have read about the luxury car business, it is the same situation in some of the other luxury businesses. Supply sides are constrained because if demand goes up suddenly, it is not possible to increase supply suddenly. So we have to live with it. We have to understand that if you want to invest, if a consumer, if a customer wants to invest in a luxury brand, there might be waiting involved. And uh, I think it also adds to the respect and the prestige of the brand when you know things are not just available and you know you can ask for a discount or anything like that. So I think this is this is going to be the way things are. We have to manage within that and I think we are doing that pretty well. Your second point was how long does it take for stores to break even? Um, 
you know, again, it depends a little bit on when the store opens, what is the situation in the mall when it opens, but largely, broadly, we can say that our stores become profitable within the first year. At a store operational level, they become profitable within the first year. Um, you asked for what is the top line and bottom line uh, going to be in the in the next year. That's uh, that's uh, I I really can't answer that. However, I have mentioned it before that our long-term goal is to grow at at least 20% uh, CAGR. Uh, we always will try to do better than that and try to touch go as close to 25% CAGR. And I think that's the range that we are forecasting for the top line growth. And bottom line, of course, should be around that or a little bit better. Uh, that's that's all that we can say at this moment. But as we go along, you will see, uh, I think, uh, you will see how quarter after quarter uh, works out. And hopefully, we, we, we will not only be able to keep to this CAGR of 20% plus, but uh, actually do a bit better. Uh, and your last question was, you know, where do we see the ASC going? Uh, that's also difficult. Um, I think these are not numbers that we can we can predict. What we can say is that ASP will continue to go up. We, you know, it went up very sharply during the COVID uh, period, mainly because uh, we we reduced the emphasis on lower price points. Uh, that is done, so we believe it will go up a little more gradually from now on, but it will continue to go up. Let's wait and see where it lands up in three years' time, but it will certainly be uh, higher than where it is today. Thank you, Abhishek. Thank you. Next question is from the line of Nirav Savai. From Avakis Asset Managers, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity and uh, very... Congratulations for your excellent set of numbers. I have three questions. And one is on the initial remarks which were made on the renovation and modernization side. So annual budget, if you can highlight, which would be allocated towards that, which would be the part of OPEX. Uh, second is this acquisition of 6.25% stake in another Swiss company, which is uh, Ote Rai. So what exactly is the purpose of that? And lastly, uh, the revenue contribution from this online billing uh, this quarter. So, in the last quarter, you used to give how much revenue has come from online. What is the revenue of, uh, uh, you know, second watches, spree on watches? So, I, I found it missing this time. So, if you can just give those details, please. Uh, sorry, Nira, can you just say what was your first question? I didn't get that clearly. No, so, the, uh, uh, how much would they be spending behind the renovation and modernization of our existing stores, uh, which uh, was highlighted in the earlier remarks that uh, there will be some spending behind renovation of stores as well? Right. So, you, 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 you will understand that there will always be renovation of stores in an ongoing process. Uh, you know, we have now 60 stores, and typically uh, within four to five years, the store needs to be renovated. How much we spend depends on what is the level of renovation. Is it a small renovation? Is it a complete renovation? If it's a complete renovation, it's like almost like setting up a new store. So if it's a small renovation, then it could be, you know, 20, 30, or 40 percent of setting up a new store. So that really depends very much on the stores coming up. And, you know, what, at that particular location, are you, are you upgrading the store to new brands? Are you keeping the same set of brands? So it's very difficult to, to put a standard number at that. But typically, for example, I think uh, we, in the next year, I think we have, we have allocated something like about three and a half to four crores uh, for the renovation of the stores that will be coming up. Your second question was regarding the investment of 6.25% in the equity of Ottery. Ottery is, is uh, again, a Swiss brand. Um, it's it's a new brand, but created by a very, very talented watchmaker who has a, a third-generation history of watchmaking. And uh, he, who is the founder, he has a very unique concept to create some new, highly complicated uh, watches. And these watches will be unveiled uh, in the last quarter of this year. And uh, we believe they will be a great success. And for us, uh, getting this 6.25% stake in the equity uh, enables us to be a part of this brand's journey, 
we get allocations of the brand for India, which will be uh, which will be beneficial. And lastly, also to understand the high-end watchmaking space from the inside. So it's also of a strategic value. And as far as the online and uh, business is concerned, I want to highlight that you know we do not distinguish anymore between online and offline. And I think most retail businesses you will find uh, will stop to do this because this distinction between online and offline is no longer relevant. It is omnichannel. Customers go seamlessly between online and offline. They'll go to a store, they'll go to the website, they'll go to social media. Everything is one omnichannel platform. <laughs> so we don't really monitor online and offline that much anymore. So I'm, I'm not going to be able to give you those online numbers separately. We believe that uh, omnichannel is the right way to address this, this business. Right, right. On this pre-owned side, if you can just uh, help us out with some number, that what are the sales of pre-owned? Just one minute. So quarter one, over quarter one in the pre-owned business has grown by about 15%. Uh, this is lower than what we had projected, which we had, uh, which our CEO had mentioned. That's because the uh, the second movement lounge, uh, which is dedicated for this business, uh, was not operated for nearly two months due to a problem at the mall where it is located. However, we expect it to be operated soon. Right, right. So, our, our broadly, our guidance of about reaching about 200 crores of size in the next three to four years is still intact, right? I mean, despite the connection of it. No, Nirav, I have not given that guidance. I am not giving guidance for three to four years oh, with a number. I do want to say that we are very confident of growing rapidly in uh, pre-owned uh, watches. We don't see a structural challenge over here. Right. That's true. All right. So that's it from my side. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. I wish you all the best. Thank you. Next question is from the line of Sharanya Agarwal from Baram Capital. Please go ahead. Um, good afternoon, sir. Congratulations on such a good set of numbers. Uh, very good excited. Sorry? I said good afternoon, sir. Yeah. Um, I'm really excited for the journey ahead. I had a question about us entering the luxury jewelry market. Um, so currently we have Misika on um, current portfolio. So I wanted to know if we're going to expand uh, existing brand product portfolios because a lot of them already do luxury jewelry or we want to add new brands such as Lancelot and others who are in the realm of luxury but not present in India and who have a significant demand. And since luxury uh, jewelry is expected to grow a lot in the future as like your per capita income grows, is that a segment that we would be interested in exploring more deeply? Okay. Do you have any other questions, Saranya? No, that was the only one. Okay. So, you know, uh, it's true there is a lot of opportunity in many, many uh, luxury segments. But after, after a detailed study, our understanding is that actually the opportunity of growth in the premium and luxury watch segment where we are is unparalleled. Okay. Um, and therefore, we believe that our priority at this time is to focus, to maximize, to extract the maximum growth and profitable growth from the premium and luxury watch segments. And this is going to be our greatest focus for the, for, for mm -hmm. right now. Uh, jewelry, for sure, jewelry has a great scope, branded jewelry. Uh, however, it will, I think over the next few years, it will be a slow takeoff, and it will come into its own probably a couple of years down the line. We are conscious about that, and we will take positions accordingly. But as I mentioned, our our Primary focus at this time is, to, is going to be to, to, to really extract the best possible we can from what is the highest potential uh, growth market in the luxury business, and that is uh, premium and luxury watches. That makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Participants, you may press star and one to ask a question. Next question is from the line of Devanshu Bansal from MK Global. Please go ahead. 
Yes, sir. Uh, thanks for the follow-up opportunity. Uh, sir, uh, as we learn from other uh, retailers, this time around wedding season was uh, uh, very bad and was hit poorly, um, hit badly uh, due to low number of wedding days. And uh, from my understanding, uh, uh, suggest that uh, your business is also sort of uh, linked to uh, uh, wedding uh, sort of uh, business in, in some way. So, uh, despite such challenges, we have delivered about uh, a very strong growth uh, in, in this quarter. So, just wanted to understand: uh, is this a is according to you this growth was a normal growth, or it would have been even better if uh, weddings? Um, uh, were there in full flow. Yeah, Devanshu, I'm uh, again. I'm not. I'm not really monitoring whether weddings were in full flow or not. I think in India, weddings are always in full flow. Sometimes a little less, sometimes a little more. But if you're saying that you know this time the wedding season was subdued and it's going to be it's going to catch up later, uh, and let me use a, a, our our. Desi phrase, aapke mu mein gishakar, and I'm sure that if the wedding season takes off better than the last one, then our results will also take off. There is a strong correlation between wedding buying and uh, you know luxury product sales. Right. Okay. Got it. And uh, typically, sir, what is the sales salient for uh, Q1? Last year it was about 22 percent. Is this a stable thing, or uh, so any thoughts on that? Uh, I didn't catch that question. Can you say that again? I'm saying, what is the typical sales salience for first quarter? Last year it was 22 percent. Uh, is it is it normally uh, in that range? Yeah, it's about the same. Got it. Sir. And this six store openings in Mall of Asia. Uh, uh, by when is this expected to uh, come in? In in uh, as in in which quarter? Well, the mall has announced that it will be ready in the last quarter of this calendar year. Uh, and we are aiming to be ready uh, to launch by that time. But typically, we have say, seen that mall dates can sometimes uh, vary and slip, depending on you know other main retailers taking place. So as of now, it's scheduled for the last quarter of this calendar year. So quarter three for this fiscal. All right. And sir, uh, last question from my end: These mono brand boutiques, uh, uh, I, I understood you were indicating, but. Still, at the sales and return level, uh, these stores are comparable uh, to the other MBO stores that we have, or uh, they have some difference. I think if you take an average, they are about the same. If you take an average of all the mono brand boutiques and you take an average of all the mono uh, multi brand stores, it's about the same. Of course, between mono brand boutiques, there would be differences. Just like between mono brand stores, uh, multi brand stores, there are differences. It depends on the brand. It depends on the location. It depends on you know. How how much the brand is pushed, how well it is known, and so on. Got it, sir. Thank you so much for taking. Thank you, thank you, Devanshu. Thank you. Next question is from the line of Shalini Gupta from East India Securities. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, sir. Sir, I had uh, my first question is that you 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 saying that your ASP is one lakh sixty thousand. But sir, you are also saying that you are retailing watches which are like ten lakhs, twelve lakhs. So, uh, what is it that is bringing your ASP down to this level? Is it that that uh, that is it because of the discounts that you have to offer on watches which are not selling? Is something? I mean, could you please discuss why it is so low? You have other questions, Shalini? Yeah. What is the average age of the inventory we have? Okay. Anything else? No, oh, that's it. Okay. It is true we are selling watches of 10 lakhs, 20 lakhs, and even one crore. But we are selling a lot more watches in the price point of 40,000, 50,000, one lakh, and so on. So as you know, average is is an average of quantity multiplied by average price. So if I sell one watch of 10 lakhs, but five watches of 50,000. So you, it's easy to do a calculation that the average will be around one lakh sixty thousand. It has nothing to do with discounts because when we say the average price is one lakh sixty thousand, that's post discount. And when we say that we are selling a watch for ten lakh, that's also post discount. And discounts are certainly not that you know they'll bring an average price from ten lakhs to one one lakh sixty thousand. Our discounts are are typically 
they range from you know between zero to a to a high of 20 percent, but that's the range of discounts. So it's really a matter of how many, what's the number of watches that you sell at different price points. And it's logical that we will sell a lot more uh, of the lower, in the lower price band than in the higher price band. For example, Mercedes will sell fewer S-class Mercedes than E-class and C-class, right? And it's exactly the same thing. As far as the average inventory is concerned, I can tell you that more than 80% of our inventory is less than one year old. Yeah, so so like uh, just a follow up, like you said that. Uh, I mean, can you just discuss like you know because you're buying out the watches. What is the uh, what is uh, and there'll be some watches which are not getting sold. So what is what do you do with these watches? We sell them. There are no watches that remain unsold. It is not. I want to underline this. This is not if we are not in the fashion watch business. You're probably you're seeing this from a fashion uh, business segment where you know trends change, fashions change, and a collection becomes unsellable. In the business of premium and luxury watches, watches remain on the catalog for five, ten, mostly fifteen, even twenty years. So even if there is a watch which is two years old, it doesn't mean that it's out of fashion. It will still sell. Um, it may take a little bit longer. And, you know, that's a question that the auditors of our company, primer, uh, uh, prior auditors were KPMG, now it's uh, Ernst & Young. They constantly examine this, and uh, uh, so far there has not been the need to make any significant provisions because they've seen that watches eventually they always sell out. Okay. And, uh, sir, how do, you, how do you keep your inventory fresh? Like, how frequently would the person visiting your online portal or your physical store, hope to see something new? That depends on the brands. So, you know, when we add, if we add a new brand, of course, you'll see the connection of that brand, which is fresh. And in the existing brands, as and when brands add new models, uh, you will see them. They don't really take off too many models. And unlike, again, I'm saying unlike the fashion watch industry, they're not adding, you know, a huge number of new models every year. It's it's a much more nuanced uh, portfolio of of products where there are some fresh products, but a large number of the existing products also continue. And sir, so what is the reason for such high inventory days? I was looking at at the balance sheet of some international brands. The inventory days are actually much higher than. What I mean looks like the 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 international norm. That's what it seems like to me. So I want to explain this. I want to explain this because I feel it's a relevant question. We are as a company are these international players are much older, and with time we will also get to similar numbers or lower than where we are today. Today we are investing into the future. When we sign on a brand in the last two years, we have signed on 19 brands. These brands are exclusive brands. They will fire two or three years later. When we reach that stage of maturity, they will start, the number of days starts to go down. These, these, these where you are looking at three or four months, there, our brand, our, our brand portfolio is significantly more diversified and key dependence on brands is also much lower. We are invest, we can, we can bring down the days if we don't bring a new, new brand, for example, into our uh, portfolio. But at this point of time, we have decided that growth is more important and we continue to invest in, in new brands because the opportunity in India over the next five to seven years is massive and we must be in a position to dominate uh, that. To that extent, we continue to invest in new brands. Uh, over to you, Vyas. Uh, and uh, sir, uh, what is the minimum number of days of inventory that we can reach then therefore? In one go because I feel like we are going one by one. If you have all your questions, okay. perhaps, you please ask your questions. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you. So what is the minimum days of inventory that, that yeah. hello? What is the minimum days of inventory that we can reach given that obviously uh, and rightly so we have a focus on growth and we are therefore tying up with more more uh, more brands. What the number one question? Number one is what is the minimum days of inventory that we can reach? Therefore, and secondly, that you you buy the product, and even then 
you are very conscious of your relationship with the brands. Why is that? I mean, do you apprehend that they may stop selling you the quantity you want? Uh, or what is it? Uh, these are my two questions. Um, as as uh, uh, our CEO Pranav told you, I think overall in the long term we will start to see a, a decline in the number of days of stock. However, while we are in a fast growth expanding mode, which is likely to continue for the next one or two years at least, if not more, uh, I don't see a very significant decline in the number of days of inventory. There are several reasons why inventories must remain high in India because it's a fast-growing economy. We are adding brands, and we need to keep a large uh, variety and stock to be able to uh, grow this segment. So it's a trade-off between do I want lower inventory or do I want higher growth? We are aiming for higher growth at least for the next couple of years. And uh, your second question was relating to inventory not selling. No, sorry. What was your second question? Your last question? Uh, my, my second question was that, so you are buying the buying the watch. Uh, why, yes, yes, yes. Why is it necessary to have a good relation? We think it's always, you know, it's not it's not a purchase that you make once and then you it's over, right? You have a good relationship because not only because it's a partnership that's going to last for years and decades, but it's also a nice way of doing business where you look after each other's interests. While it's a commercial transaction, but you do that. You know, our customers also buy a watch, and that doesn't mean that we don't keep a good relationship with them. They keep a good relationship with us, and we keep a good relationship with them. Uh, it's the same thing. You go to your Kirana store, and you buy things from them, but you still want to have a good relationship. You want to make, you know, if he will wish you, you will wish him. It's that. So I think it's a way of doing business. It is business, but it's not only transactional. So it's, I think it's very, very important to keep this relationship. Uh, you know, it's also a matter of trust. Uh, this is a partnership. They are entrusting us with the well-being of their brand. We are, uh, uh, and they are entrusting us to expand their brand, and we are trusting them to, to give us their products and help us to grow. It's a, it's a quid pro quo, and therefore it, it needs a strong relationship. I hope I've answered your question, Shalini. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, sorry, Shalini, but uh, due to time constraint, we won't be able to take any more questions. I will now hand the conference over to the management for closing comments. Um, thank you very much. I would like to thank all the participants in this call for your patient hearing, for the very interesting questions, and I hope to uh, we hope to see you again uh, at the next earnings call. Uh, thank you once again, and wish you a nice day. Thank you very much. On behalf of Ethos Limited, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us. You may now disconnect your lines. Thank you.